Well, I just, I just, I just made a great reference to the Rolling Stones. Yeah, that's not a joke. Yeah. References to that joke. That's a quip. That's right. <laughs> like a long, involved joke. A monk, a knight, and a that's turtle a went twist. into a pub. And, I'm just kidding. And a turtle? What? She's making it up. I don't know. That's right. Set it up. Like, you know, that's right. Benedict, Aquinas, and Anselm went for a walk. Oh, that sounds great already. <laughs> Are we, are, we, are we live now? Yeah, we are good. Now. All right. So now that we've all gotten some satisfaction there with Anselm, um, a couple of remarks uh, before we move on. Um, I, I said in one of our earlier sessions that the point of all this was not theology for theology's sake, but because there is there's such a connection between the theology of the churches of the medieval period and, and there's such a... Um, there's such a permanence to it that it really becomes a permanent part of everything that we would call Roman Catholic theology. Um, it's important to understand where these things come from. They they all come from places. You know, I had a question asked of me at the break. Um, you know, which is you know how did, how did this stuff really all just just happen? And I think it doesn't just happen. It evolves over a period of time, right? Theology tends to evolve to answer questions that people have about things that they don't have answers to. And the other thing I want to say here um, before we move on is that just to remember that theology, theology is the servant to the church, and it can never become its master. Mm -hmm. Right? Theology is here to serve the church and to help us explain things that are deep and are tough to get our head around. And the metaphors in the New Testament, the metaphors that we use in this class, the the the, the way that Anselm or Aquinas or the other other theologians represent information these are to help us understand things that in many ways are very very difficult to understand mm -hmm. um, I am not a theologian I'm not a classically trained rhetorician I you know these things are very very difficult to understand what I'm trying to give us here is a snapshot a big picture of here are the eight or nine things about Anselm that are important and as you look at those you can see um, how they end up um, being part of um, our belief system even today um, and before we go on to Aquinas, who is uh, there with his little little um, feather, I guess, you know, in his in inkwell. <laughs> There's quill, rather, yeah, this feather, you know. It's uh, it's 3.30 in the afternoon, so I'm, I'm beyond my Cadoba coma at this point. Um, but, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is um, what we just read and what we just talked about in Anselm, um, try and imagine... The, the church of the time beginning to really embrace that idea instead of staying as they had. You know, um, what if the doctrines and the teachings and the principles that Anselm stood for with respect to the atonement, what if those things had, had become the everyday life of the church? It's hard to imagine the need later for the, for the, uh, the, the Reformation and some of those things, you know, that, that would later come. And so I think... You know, Anselm was a man in many ways before his time. So Thomas Aquinas, um, a near contemporary um, of our friend Anselm, and um, differs from him in a number of different ways. 1274 um, is Mr. Thomas Aquinas. And um, some have called him the greatest theologian of the Middle Ages. And... I would probably take some issue with that. That's kind of a personal preference. Um, but at the age of 14, he went to the University of Naples. Um, his father was a Dominican, um, and his teacher, his Dominican teacher, was so impressed by his uh, ability to understand that um, after a couple of conversations, Thomas decided that he would join this new um, study-oriented Dominican order. Um, his mom apparently opposed the decision, um, wanting her son to become more financially secure and, um, you know, as an abbot or an archbishop or something else. But he took the friar's vow of poverty nonetheless. And um, there's a story, I, I read it three sources, so it sounds like it's probably right. But his brothers actually, when they found out he was going to do this, they actually kidnapped him and took him away for several months, wow. um, 15 months apparently. And uh, that his family at one point tempted him 
with a prostitute and other offers um, and to try and dissuade him um, from his chosen profession. So um, remember now, again, thinking backwards a little bit here, that the idea of what you and I would call a liberal or a secular education didn't exist in Europe at this time. Um, it hadn't even really occurred to anyone. So all learning took place under the watchful eye of the church at the cloister schools or the cathedral schools, as we've discussed. And so um, learning took place really with the church, and theology was sort of the queen of the sciences. Um, how many of you guys know who Ravi Zacharias is? And obviously Ed and some others. Ravi Zacharias, R-Z-I-M dot org, I think, is the website. Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. An outstanding Christian apologist, very, very, very sharp. Um, older now, in his 70s, I think. Um, but he, he, um, he has a series called Just Thinking. It's a series of podcasts. And he does a great job of talking about theology and philosophy in the early, in, in the, in the um, earlier in, in the medieval and Roman church and how those two sort of exchanged places as the queens of disciplines. And so uh, see, see, his, um, see his website for information about that. But, you know, up until the time of, uh, uh, really, of, of Aquinas and Anselm, theology was the queen of all sciences. So theologians were um, the computer scientists, if you will, or the financial wizards of their day. These, these were the people that were highly respected. And so Thomas had a few uh, important quotes, and, and one of them, of course, you see up there. So the Thuma, the, the Summa Theolo Theologi, or Theologica, the sum of all you know, theological wisdom, his very humbly um, named major work, as we've said. Um, but he said this, he said, in, in theology, all things are treated from the standpoint of God. Okay, and that's interesting because um, what he's basically saying is that all of all knowledge and all wisdom <coughs> really are, are oriented from God as opposed to from the human mind. Um, another famous statement of his, very very famous statement, and it's it's behind us, and you'll take, you know, you'll re react to this probably as I did. Christ won grace; the church imparts it. Christ won grace, the church imparts it. Um, so think about what that means for a person. And think about the power that that gives the wow. church. Wow. Right? And that in, in, invisible connection. Now, if we had more time, we could have an interesting discussion about to what extent that actually has truth in it. Mm-hmm. Right? Think about it for a moment. Yeah. Can anyone think of a principle that we teach in our fellowship that has echoes of that idea? Can anyone think of a situation? Yes? You leave the church, you leave the God. Well, yeah, we, 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 would, we would say that, wouldn't we? Right? That to abandon the Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, would be, in a sense, to abandon God. So there's a, we don't mean that in the same way that Aquinas meant it, but we understand that connection. What else? I mean the restoration process of a of a of a fallen brother or something like that. And just yeah. okay. I think even just uh, reaching out to people because uh, we kind of put the I know sometimes we put the burden on ourselves that oh if I don't say something to this person then they're going to miss out on God's grace. Okay, so in the sense of evangelizing, bringing them into the community of Christ, what do you think, Matt? Church discipline. Yeah, church discipline is the one that comes comes out to me, right? The idea of excommunicating someone, right, barring them from the fellowship. Right, that when the church takes an action such as that, right? So again, I don't, I don't think you know. Ed, maybe you have, maybe you have a comment here on this. I don't think we mean this quite the same way Aquinas meant it, but we understand the sentiment that the church is an essential part yeah. of salvation, right? Right, and the, and the people are not saved outside of yeah. the church. The church, in, in that sense, is the body of Christ. Um, but it's interesting. He's basically saying here that the church imparts this grace, and we're going to talk about what he meant through that. One of the things he meant by that was that the sacraments, all right, so who knows what that is? Who wants to, what are the sacraments? You start off with, with the Catholic, I think, was I think about this. You start off with baptism as an infant. You get first communion and first or second grade. You get 
Gosh, um, I know at the end of high school you were confirmed back into the church. Yeah, those are the modern ones. We're talking about the seven sacraments. I'm going to do a section on that next. But does anybody happen to know what the seven sacraments are? Or? Baptism, confirmation, ordination, unction, matrimony, penance, and, and the Eucharist. So, wow. right, no, not bad, not bad. A budding Roman Catholic. This is great. Where are you reading? He says that the sacraments are visible signs, visible signs of invisible, visible signs of invisible things, visible signs of invisible things. Baptism is for the remission of original sin. Penance removes sins committed after baptism. Okay? We don't have time to discuss, I'm not going to quote him as much as I did Anselm, okay? But, but there are lots of reasons why he comes up with these ideas. But what I want you to understand is that by because he was so prominent, because he was so widely read and so widely quoted, when he begins to lay down these precepts, they stick. They stick. And here again, you see the long arm of the systemizing, the system of doctrine from, from the rule of Benedict. You, you see the importance um, that these fathers, if you will, these scholastics played in the church, that they influenced doctrine in enormous and significant ways for long, long, long periods of time. Um, Aquinas wrote... Tons of stuff. Um, he was probably best noted for his um, very, very um, vibrant defense of Aristotelian logic and how that worked with faith. We are not going to get into that. I don't know if I can. I'm not sure I'm equipped to have all those conversations. But the long and the short of it is reason, he said, and again, this is following Aristotle. This is a quote. Reason is based on sensory data. What we see, feel, hear, smell, and touch. Revelation, however, is based on more. While reason can lead us to believe in God, something other theologians have already proposed, only revelation can show us God as he really is, the triune God. So he did distinguish between what reason could accomplish and what revelation could accomplish. And so, again, you see here kind of the apex of scholasticism, right? What was one of the purposes of scholasticism? To marry this idea of reason with theology, reason and faith. And Thomas here basically says, listen, here's how I define the two. Reason will is based on inputs, things I can see, feel. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing things in my mind is processing those. But to, it'll lead me to belief in God, but only revelation can show me the reality of God. Another famous metaphor that Aquinas used, I'm not sure if it's actually on one of my slides or not, maybe it is, but was this idea that reason was the vestibule of faith. Anybody ever heard that phrase before, right? Does anybody know what a vestibule is? Church architecture, Ed, what's the vestibule? Uh, it's the, kind of a, an ante room, uh, kind of a, a room that precedes the main room. Right, so this particular hall doesn't actually have what we would call a vestibule, but think about think about a large stone church, well, maybe you do. Maybe that little thing. Got that little thing out there. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, right. But, but a vestibule in a main, like in an old Gothic cathedral, an old European church, or a big stone church. I'm trying to think of one around here. Um, one that we would all know here in Hampton Roads. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, a Lynn Haven colony doesn't really count. Huh? I'm trying to think. You know. But anyway, like in a, think, of, think about like a big old Baptist church. Like, you know, you walk in through the, through the big front doors, and then there's like kind of a big area where people sort of congregate, and then you go a little closer, and it's quiet, and that's like the sanctuary is separate and the vestibule would be the opening right and so he says reason is like the vestibule to faith right that it's 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 a it's a path along the way um yeah it's it's a path along the way um some other interesting things that he said um indulgences have efficacy or have impact on both the dead and the living Wow. So think about this for a minute. Wow. I have a dead grandma. Right. And she's 
smoking away in purgatory somewhere, burning off the sins that she committed against Grandpa. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? I mean, I, these are these are metaphors, okay? I'm not, I'm not you know, I, I'm not. Right? These are all hypotheticals. <laughs> Something tells me that's going to be the only thing you guys remember. And that's going to that's get spliced out and like splatter all over the internet. I'll be 75 years old and I'll be living down that metaphor. <laughs> And, 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 and I'm feeling, it's Grandma's birthday today, and I'm kind of missing her, and I happen to walk by the cathedral, and there's a guy out front collecting indulgences. Well, what am I likely to do? Right? Pay. Pay. So that what I do here on earth impacts what happens in eternity. That the church now begins to have... Not, it wasn't enough that the Roman church had authority over all the affairs of men on life, but now the church reaches across time and can control eternity, the domain of God. Wow. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of fear. How did they back that up with the scripture? Well, they didn't. I mean, they may have had a, I mean, I don't know, they may have had a verse or two. You know, I mean, the moment the coin into the pot clings, a soul from eternity yeah, springs. Yeah, the, the, the one verse that was used um, quite a bit uh, came from Second Maccabees 12, and you wouldn't be familiar with this. I'll just read it to you. Somebody had that question after, earlier. After a battle that occurred, and it's, it's the Jews in battle, but some Jews died and they happened to have some idols on them. So, so, so they all blessed the ways of the Lord, the righteous judge who reveals the things that are hidden. And they turned to supplication, that is to pray, uh, praying that the sin that had been committed might be wholly blotted out. This is by people who had died. The noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves free from sin, for they had seen with their own eyes what had happened as a result of the sin of those who had fallen. He also took up a collection, man by man, to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver and sent it to Jerusalem to provide a sin offering. In doing so, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore, he made atonement for the dead so that they might be delivered from their sin. Mm. Wow. That's, wow. that's mm -hmm. big time what it's, it's all based on in the Catholic Church. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's think about that. Thank you, Ed. I, I, I didn't know that. So let's think about that for a minute. He's saying, pray for the dead. What I do here on life, I can make atonement for the dead. Why is that incorrect? Who paid for the sins of the living and the dead? Jesus, Jesus did that. Right? Christ, <coughs> Christ's work was finished at the cross and at the resurrection. Death no longer has mastery over him, right? That that he is the Lord and the God who will judge both the living and the dead. Right? Mm -hmm. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Right? In view of his appearing and his coming, I give you this charge. Preach the word, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the church begins to have influence. Um, their dispensation belongs to the Pope as the head of the church. This whole idea of superabundance, Ed uh, alluded to that earlier. Um, it's, it, Abelard talks a little bit about this and addresses this. If we get time, I want to deal with this in the next session, okay? So I, I don't want to get, get – um, I don't know. Do you want to make one more remark on that, Ed? Or I, I, I'm not, it, it, it's a longer discussion than I wanted to get into here. Well, it's similar to what Travis said is that between the saints and, then of course, Jesus, especially the saints, they, they did more than their fair share of righteousness. So where does all of that righteousness get credited? It's stored up, yeah. It's in the treasury of the church. Church is then can dispense it as they see fit. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and then and and then a, a close a close um a close second there. He says the um here, here's a here's a quote about it. The passion of the redeemer is not merely sufficient; it was also superabundant satisfaction for the sins of the human race. Again, you know this idea that Christ was so victorious that there's kind of all this extra extra righteousness floating around 
that the church, of course, has access to and can dispense in various ways as it sees fit. Um, he believed that the fire of hell was physical and real. That, that, and that here, another famous quote, that the resurrection body is the same even unto thy bowels. Meaning that it's literally a physical body that performs and acts exactly like the body that we have. Things about cardinal virtues, cardinal sins, those are ideas. Um, here's a famous one. Rome is the mistress of all other churches. To obey her is to obey Christ. Ooh. Wow. Famous sayings. Okay. And the Pope determines what is faith. Submission to him is necessary to salvation. And he just wrote these things down, right? And they begin to teach these things. And so you see in Aquinas, kind of in some sense, the summa theologica of what we would later call Roman Catholic theology, right? That, that all of the pieces are beginning to come together, that power has been consolidated in the church. Physical power, spiritual power over life and death um, and, 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 and um, uh, obedience, you know, this idea of obedience to the church, obedience to the papacy as necessary for salvation. So if you study with friends that are of the Roman Catholic persuasion now and they're fairly orthodox or fairly devout, there's an enormous amount of guilt that they feel. It's, it's all, all tied back to these kinds of teachings that are deeply rooted in Catholic theology. Yeah, I see several hands. So how did one man become like, who basically made, wrote a lot of stuff down that wasn't necessary? That wasn't based on scripture. Become the like, like he. The voice of the church. Off. Yeah. How did he like write? Like he wrote down a lot of stuff, and it seems like almost everything he wrote down is followed today. It's like, how mm -hmm. did he so dramatically change it? With, like he writing. Well, I think one of the one of the ways to think about it is, um, and I think I used this analogy with somebody earlier, but you know, think about Mozart being sort of the court composer for the empire. His job was to write the songs of the empire. These guys, their job was to write the theology for the church. Yeah. That, 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 that's kind of what they did. They were hired and paid in many ways to, to generate and systematize doctrine. Okay? I mean, that, that, was, that was what they did. And so the church, because they were articulate, because they were intelligent, because they understood philosophy, and because they were politically connected, um, you know, they, 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 would, they had a lot of influence. So it's, it's um, I think, the, the other thing to remember is that this, and, and I, I want to say this carefully, but this was not a time when, you know, the, the mass of population wasn't literate, wasn't educated, and so ideas were currency. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, and if the church or a prominent abbot or a prominent bishop or a prominent politician or someone prominent in your town had a copy of Aquinas or had heard about Aquinas, <laughs> And, and was teaching that, you, you just you didn't question it because you, you couldn't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You couldn't know. And so, again, the reason we talked about the history and culture is so much of this is just the way that the, the culture just evolved this way. And that the church and the state were in many ways the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's really no different today than, you know, you're driving out in Virginia and if, and if, and if a state trooper pulls you over, you just pull over. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just the law of the land. It's just the way that it is. All right. Other questions? Yes? It seems like Aquinas is laying a lot of the foundations for establishing the Pope as the vicar of Christ. But I thought that had happened previously. Um, I don't know the whole history of that particular doctrine. I don't, Ed, do you have any? I'm not sure the whole. But it, it is interesting that the, the groundwork is laid quite early, but when it becomes incorporated into the catechism, the official catechism right. of the Catholic Church, some things come much later. I think, for example, the, um, uh, the, the the virgin attributes of Mary, interesting, I think don't make it in until about 1845 with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Right. But yet you go all the way back to the Council of Ephesus and whatever that was, 431, uh, when when it was already somewhat established. So I think what Travis said is, is right, that, that this was already the understanding of the people just the date that it becomes official in the catechism may, may have been later. But, yeah. but the practice of, even the practice of the, the Pope speaking ex cathedra, that's the big issue. Ex cathedra is just the Latin, I mean the Greek word that means from the official seat. So when he's in the official seat and speaks, that is regarded as inspired. 
if he's just casually speaking to you, that's not considered inspired. Uh, of course, there were then pope after pope that denounced what was said by other popes ex cathedra, uh, which presents a logic dilemma, obviously, uh, for them along the way, too. But that practice started much earlier in the, in the Dark Ages, even if it wasn't like codified in the catechism until much later. At this point, is he I don't know about the term vicar yet. Yeah, I know. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good gauge on that one. I'll, I'll try to look it up before we get to the internet. Yeah, here. yes. Um, <laughs> hopefully, you, hopefully you can follow up with a question, but uh, I'm trying to word it right. So with the sacraments, uh, as far as the, you know, with Tetzel, you put the, the money in the, the bag. And, yeah, um, again, that, that's, that's later, but yes, yeah. How do they reason, how do they come up with, well, I know it's to raise money for the, for the church and structure, I believe. But uh, like they don't see that in scripture. Like how do they? Well, I think Ed, Ed talked a little while ago about the, 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 the quote drachma that were raised for the dead oh, from Maccabees. Maccabees. From Maccabees, right? Yeah. So again, somebody asked me a question earlier. You know, what, what at what point do the um, do the apocryphal texts kind of play on Catholic doctrine? I didn't have a good answer because I didn't know that answer. So that's an example. So I forget who asked me that question. But was it you, Josh? Yes. Oh no, I don't no know. okay. Um, yeah. So um, you know. You I talked about earlier about how you know the, the church basically hired these script writers to come with the best uh, theology for, for what's good for them. Well, well, was it just like a big committee of dudes, like money hungry guys? Or no, guys? no. I I, I think um, honestly, it's hard to assess the um, motives of men that have been dead for a thousand years. Um, but but I, I mean, it's a fair question, right? Like it's like. Who are these guys? I mean, are these guys the boogeyman? I don't think so. I don't think so. These are men who, like all men, were products of their times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? They were reacting to and responding to very real political forces, very real needs in the church to summarize, explain, and help take very, very challenging concepts and make them, make them explainable to lay people. These were men who were caught up in, in a movement of Aristotelian philosophy and, and logic and reason. And we're trying to take their very logical minds and their very spiritual inclinations and make them work together. And it's just difficult. First Corinthians 1 talks about that. It's just difficult to do that. And so I don't think these guys are the devil. I don't think they're the boogeyman. I think they're men with sinful natures whose sinful natures happen to be their intelligence and, and their glorification and even deification of reason over and against other other virtues. That that's my take. I'm not saying that that's how it was. That's that's how I see it. You know. Um, so you know, neither are people like Barton Stone or Alexander Campbell heroes. They're just men. All right. Those are you guys know who they are from the, the Restoration. Yeah. Ed will talk about who they are in a day or two. Um, you know. So they're they're not they're not to be deified. They're just men in culture responding to things as best they can. Um, we, we, we just need to move along. I know there's more questions. There could be, we could have long conversations. This is really soteriology that we're kind of getting into here a little bit. A couple of other things I do want to point out though about Aquinas that are significant. Um, you can read on the slide. I'm not even going to cover all of these things I think for the sake of time. I, I think there is, um, the third bullet is an interesting one. You know, Aquinas talked about when Christ died did he give me the title to life or just freedom from condemnation? And that kind of gets back to our view of what did Christ accomplish on the cross? And I see some of you rolling your eyes and is there some hair splitting going on here? Yes. Um, I think the answer is yes. Yes. But again, you see a little bit of that underlying argument of trying to figure out, is it this or is it that? Is right. it sick at none? Is it yes or no? Is it this way or that way? Is it, is it reason or is you know, did Jesus do this or did he do that? And trying to take positions on things when the answer is maybe both. Um, the superabundance issue, again, without explaining it any more than Ed already has, a couple of things that came out of this that I think are important to think about. One, um, this idea that the passion of Christ was sufficient, uh, not only sufficient, but abundant for all of mankind's sin, right? And that the church holds the treasury of merit for all sinners. So that if you're a little bit low on merit and you're a little bit low on good works, head on down to the church and they'll help a brother out, okay? <laughs> in, in whatever way you want to kind of do that. 
And the other lasting doctrine, and here you can see what we would call distinctly Romish theology, okay? Um, humanism and works. Remission of sin depends to a certain extent on the character and conduct of the individual as a ground or procuring cause. What is he saying there? Is he saying, look, that for my sins to be forgiven, G Jesus forgave them, but I also have to kind of be a certain kind of character and do a certain kind of thing. He begins to introduce this idea of human merit as necessary for salvation. As necessary for salvation. And if you think about it for a minute, he would have to do that. He would have to do that to kind of agree with the other tenets of his theology. Yeah. Um, he does say, this is a quote, the sinner is totally dependent upon God for the remission of his sin, both in respect to the declarative act by which he is acquitted and in respect to all the judicial procedure and apparatus of atonement which must precede the declarative or justifying act. <laughs> this gives you a little bit of an idea of what it's like to read him, okay? <laughs> Aquinas um, does teach that remission of sin depends to a certain extent on the character of the individual. Um, he's confusing here a little bit justification and sanctification. That distinction is, a, is, a, um, is one for a class on soteriology. The other thing that he said that I want to make sure we point out, I don't think it's actually here on the slide. Um, he uses the phrase, the configuration to Christ. And what, what he's actually meaning is that, our, that God's satisfaction is complete and it's brought about in what he calls a, this is a quote, a sacramental manner by baptism. In case of sin after baptism, the believer must be configured to Christ by a personal suffering in the form of penance, as well as the acceptance of the sufferings of the Redeemer. That, that Jesus suffered for me, but I also have to suffer through acts of penance. And those two things together make sure that I'm okay after baptism. So baptism deals again, as, it, as with Anselm, with remission of original sin. And so I'm sacramentally saved, but there's this ongoing work of salvation that both the merit of Christ and my merits as a good person ob um, obtained for me. All right? So this is, this is obviously a significant problem and a significant challenge. Um, it is not in, in itself sufficient to atone for sin, but it's penance, he says, is not in and of itself sufficient to atone for sin, but in connection with the sacrifice of Christ, it has a value of its own, which cannot be dispensed in making up the full sum of legal, legal satisfaction. In other words, he didn't go all the way and say, penance remits sin, but penance in combination with the vicarious work of Christ ensures remission of sin after baptism. All right? Is, is that clear? So um, I want to move on here um, to a guy named Peter Lombard. And uh, when do we need to take another break, Matt? Let's see. That's okay. We're 30 minutes in. Oh, great. Yeah. great. Um, I think the distinction between Aquinas and um, and um, Anselm, principally for our, our purposes, is um, their view of atonement and how atonement works. All right. So um, Aquinas, I think, is is still very, very prominent. I, obviously, you know, if, if, if you know anything about Roman Catholic doctrine, you can see um, the threads. And again, I've said this several times. I'll say it one more time here before we go to Lombard. What I'm trying to help us understand is this isn't theology for theology's sake, but in during the Middle Ages, doctrines were put in place that have lasted for centuries. There's, there's a lasting influence, and Christian thought has remained unchanged along many of these lines for a thousand years. A thousand years, all right? And so that is one whole heck of a lot of influence. Um, Peter Lombard, um, 1100 to 1162, so slightly predating um, these two other gentlemen. And we're gonna treat him fairly quickly. I think I have one slide on him. Um, he's important because, I know there's a lot of text up there, okay? again. Probably too much writing. Lombard is important principally because he's sort of generally considered the system, the one of the, the the father of systematic theology in the Catholic Church, and and I say that because he predates the two gentlemen that we just talked about. The reason we're looking at him third is because his principal influence was on the two of them, and his secondary influence is he wrote a book, a famous book or a, a treatise really called the Four Sentences. 
And it was the most popular theological book of the Middle Ages. It was, it was very, very, very widely read, probably more widely read even than scripture itself. And so for that, because of that, he was incredibly, incredibly influential. He's the guy that basically proposed the idea of the seven sacra sacraments, in a sense, or in invented them. And so on the slide behind me, I want to take a look through this because this is something I think that's, that you see fully developed or fully orbed, if you will, in Anselm and especially in Aquinas. But here's where they all come from. And um, you begin to see not only does the, does the church own these things, but there are specific things inherent in this that completely tie um, all of our spiritual life back to the physical um, uh, manifestation of the church on earth. All right. Um, a comment he made about women. This is very interesting. The woman was not taken from Adam's head as if she were to rule over him, nor from his feet as if she were to be a slave, but from his side that she might be his consort or partner. So it's kind of an interesting. Yeah, yeah that so many times. I know it's yeah, that, that, that's actually from Lombard. It's, it's, sometimes, um, it's sometimes quoted, um, it's sometimes attributed to, um, who's the other church historian? I can't think of it, but actually... I, Five sources, four of them said it was Lombard, and one of them said it was, um, no, what, some, one of the, some other church historian, but actually, he was actually quoting Lombard, so pretty sure four out of five sources say, <laughs> <laughs> survey says. that's right, survey says, come on, no, no, no game show people, what do you guys do with all your time, <laughs> come on, Ed, you guys don't have GSN down here, the game show network? How would I say? It's like the only channel in Pittsburgh if you don't have regular cable. Wow. <laughs> the Game Show Network and like... What are you doing? Yeah, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm sitting around all day long watching game shows. That's the key to a great, 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 building a great church. Brett, he's online, man. Can I get some more? Oh, sure. That'd be great. Thanks, man. <laughs> no, I'm just... <laughs> Why, why are you laughing? What did I do? <laughs> no, I really mean I'm just pleased. I'm just thirsty. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's like, what? I'm dismissing him. You know, that's not what I'm doing. I'm sorry, Matt. Did I hurt your feelings? <laughs> He's hanging his head back there. <laughs> if you're not here, it was funnier here than it probably is out there. But he said some interesting things about the fall of man. Um, and again, we, we get into some theology here. I, I want to just touch on this. But that man suffered what he called vulneratio, or what, the word from which we get vulnerability. That he was wounded in the fall, but he was not deprived of all virtue. So he would not agree with the idea of total depravity, for example, as you see on the slide. That man suffered, in some sense, a wound. That he was wounded in the fall, but it didn't destroy all possibility of virtue. We don't have time to argue the merits or demerits um, of that view, but it's interesting because it, it gets to the whole idea of how can sin be satisfied and what does it really mean to repent, which we see later in the Middle Ages. Baptism. Immersion is the proper form, the triune form, or the single dip. In other words, he follows, thank you, Matt, he follows um, Gregory, and he says, got to immerse him, but you can do the triple dip, or you can do it once with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he kind of follows Gregory in that. Baptism, again, with the, with the, the middle, middle church fathers here, says that baptism destroys the guilt of original sin. Um, Lord's, the Lord's Supper, he, he is one of the earliest voices that says, uses this idea of the elements being transmuted into the body and blood of Christ. That there's something mystical that happens, transubstantiation. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah. This idea, this is the idea that that the element that in the Lord's Supper, the, the bread and the wine, actually become in some sense the physical body and blood of Christ, that they're transmuted. So again, if that's true, and the church is the owner of the sacrament, so if, if, if the body and blood of Christ is transmuted in the Lord's Supper, and the church owns the Lord's Supper, and I'm not part of the church, you don't get transmuted. right, I, I don't have access to Corpus Christi, to the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? This is where these things go. Right? Um, atonement. Christ's death did not pay a ransom to the devil. So again, we're kind of back on, on that theory. And you can see how Lombard, again, in, 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 in influenced Anselm. The Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit were, this is a very interesting phrase, 
a certain highest being, and that the substance neither begets nor is begotten, nor does it proceed from anything. This is kind of his doctrine of the Trinity. This is a precarious position, and again, we don't have time to get into all the implications of it, but suffice to say that he, he didn't hold um, what you and I would consider a particularly orthodox view of Father, Son, and the Spirit being kind of one in nature and one in essence. Um, this phrase, a certain highest being, um, became troubling for some of the later writers, um, probably as it's troubling to you and troubling to me. Um, so I think I, I just wanted to talk about Lombard for a minute because you see in him the seeds, right, that, 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 that Anselm and Aquinas later um, sow. Um, let's talk about the seven sacraments and where they came from and why they are significant. Um, here's, here's what he says. Baptism is for birth. Okay? The Eucharist is a symbol of community. Penance for grief of sin or second sins. By that he means sins committed post-baptism. All right? Indulgences are there for the remission of post Baptismal sin. Again, you've heard these things before. Extreme unction is the sacrament for death, right? Kind of intervening, literally at the moment of death. Blessed Virgin Mary, pray for us now. Pray for sinners now and at the hour of our death. All that kind of stuff. Um, I wasn't Catholic, but I heard it once. I saw it once. It was kind of crazy. Ordination is the sacrament for ministry. We actually practiced that. I was ordained. Um, now, I think in Pennsylvania, it's simply a legal designation. It allows me to preach and be paid for doing so. And I think there may be tax, tax things with that. But it's just a legal thing. Um, marriage, here's a very interesting one. Marriage is for procreation and the protection against lust. So why would that be interesting? What does that tell us? about his anthropology or what does it suggest about his view of man and his view of flesh mm -hmm, that's corrupted and so what ancient heresy is that connected to hmm? Gnosticism raising its funky head here in the seven sacraments okay well right You're right and so what you see again is a blending of secular and sacred mythology here in the Middle Ages, right? Again, think back to Gregory, right? When Gregory began to kind of open the door between the community and the church and introduce festivals and feasts and the days for the saints, he begins to introduce human ideas into the church. He didn't protect the gates of the community in a sense. And so centuries later, you see those influences, they pervade. And so what I think we need to take away from this is that it's always important to protect true doctrine and protect the church right. from the influences of the world. Because, you know, we don't really, it, it's hard to imagine, but the decisions that you make today in your ministries and the decisions that you make as you lead and the things that you teach or fail to teach, that they will outlive you mm -hmm. wow. in ways that you don't appreciate and don't understand. The things that we teach and the things that we stand for as a movement and as individuals, they'll live on past our children. They'll, they'll live on mm -hmm. in the centuries to follow us. And, you know, n don't ever underestimate the power of the truth. Wow. Hmm? You know, buy the truth. Don't sell it. Um... Baptism, he believed, was the door to other sacraments and to the kingdom of heaven. That's actually a quote. Quote, it is not essential to salvation except for persons who desire to be baptized and have not had the opportunity to receive the right. Unquote. Let me read it again. Quote, baptism is the door to the other sacraments and to the kingdom of heaven. It is essential except for persons who desire to be baptized and have not had the opportunity to receive the right. What is the logical fallacy in that statement? So if he says it's the door, 
but but then he says it's not essential. Well, he actually says it's essential. Oh, I thought you said not essential. Unless you desire, but then you don't get the chance. So, like, right. if you want to get baptized and you get killed, then you're still good. Mm-hmm. That's right. Uh, right. Yeah. So he says something, and then he unsays it. <laughs> <laughs> right? He says, baptism is essential. It's essential for salvation. Unless you were wanting to, and it just doesn't work out that way. Unless, if you get killed on the way to your baptism, it's not essential for you. Yeah. Yeah. The desire on their part to be regenerated by water and the Holy Spirit is certain. This is, and so this is his argument. How is that possible? Quote, the desire on their part to be regenerated by the water and the Holy Spirit is certain evidence that the heart is already regenerated. For the necessity of baptism, we rely upon John 3, 3. Except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he quotes a scripture that we would use and agree with. But what he basically says is that their good intentions are enough. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just a symbol. Just your heart. Right. And you see, again, the seeds of this kind of thinking. Right? That mm-hmm. baptism is necessary. Yep. But, but, well, if I didn't get around to it, but my heart was in the right place and I really wanted... You see the seeds of this kind of theology. Early. Early. Yes. How accessible is the Bible to the To the public? Well, Gutenberg was 1540? Earlier. Well, 1490. 1490, okay. So in terms of printed copies of it rolling around, not particular. There would have been manuscripts, but not, not widely acceptable. Not widely accessible, excuse me, not widely accessible. Would, All right. Would he have had access to it? Oh, yeah, these guys would have had access to manuscripts, absolutely. And Greek texts and, and Jerome's Latin Vulgate and uh, yeah, other things like that, right? So, yeah, well, we haven't even gotten into sort of the whole penitentia um, kind of thing yet. But um, the seven sacraments. So here's the challenges with them, and we're going to move very quickly through this, okay? Okay. Um, they quoted John 20, 23. Somebody want to look that up for us? That the church has authority to absolve sin. They said, yes. Can you read that nice and loud? John 20, 23. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Okay. How many of you guys have had biblical eggs of Jesus? All right, a handful of you. For those of you who have had that, why is... Why is this teaching that the church has authority to absolve sin, why is that not a valid text to teach that? What's wrong with that? The church has authority to absolve sin. Yeah, that's the doctrine. And the, and the proof text that they use is John 20, 23. I know it's the afternoon, guys. What do we think? Why, why, is, why does that passage not teach that? Is it out of context? I don't know. Is it? I'm about to read it again. Can you read it again? What's the number one rule of exegesis? It can be now, what it is being then. Right, and? What? I heard it. Context. Context of that passage. And how do we answer questions of context? Who is speaking to whom? And he's talking to whom? The apostles. And doesn't right before that he received the Holy Spirit? Right. Who is, that passage is being written to apostles by Jesus, very specific situation, right? Mm-hmm. So just wanted to throw in a little dig there for the importance of biblical exegesis, okay? Mm-hmm. Most heresies are born out of proof texting. Lots, mm-hmm. lots and lots and lots. Sometimes even from Maccabees. Mm-hmm. It's proof texting from the Maccabees. I'm not sure if you can actually proof, proof text from a non-biblical manuscript, all right? Mm-hmm. Something else from our friend Mr. Lombard. Penitentium agite. Jerome's Vulgate. And Ed is the expert on all things with respect to this, so I will defer to him on this. But Lombard and others of this period of time were reading Jerome's Latin Bible, which translated the word metanoia as do penance. Mm. As do penance. An unfortunate translation, if ever there was one. (laughs) Yeah. And again, Ed's the expert in in how all this worked. But 
for centuries and centuries and centuries. They were allowed, they, they used, the Catholic Church used this text and used this idea. It kind of fit with the humanism and it fit with the direction that they were going anyway. But now there it is, right there in Latin, the original language of the Church Fathers. In Latin, right there. You know. Wow. I'm teasing, of course, right? Um, I'm not sure why Duns Scotus ended up in there, so sorry about that. I probably just didn't take it out from last time. Penance consists of four elements. Here's how to be penitent. Contrition of heart. Confession with the mouth. Satisfaction by works. And the priest's absolution. What a great exegesis of 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 11. <laughs> not. <laughs> you guys with me there? Yeah. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 11. What is that passage all about? Godly, Godly grief. Godly sorrow. That produces repentance. Their idea is penance. Got to feel sorry. Got to make noise with your mouth. You got to do good works. And huh. the priest has to agree. Wow. 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 The priest's absolution is basically the form of the penance, the final form. Without it, it is not, um, not, op not operative. Okay? Not operative. Handful of other things. Again, we're not going to cover all of these. Um, absolution of sin generally was reserved for bishops. Indulgences. Um, here's just a variety of things. This is how you could get them. All right? for, if you, for example, if you went on a crusade. Well, that's handy. <laughs> I mean, need some indulgences for grandma because she's smoking down there with grandpa. And I think I'll go on a crusade and kill some Seljuk Turks. Wow. Well, this is kind of how this operated. Yeah. Right? And I, I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm being hyperbolic, but th that's actually not, hypo but not hypothetical. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, indulgences could be um, garnered by visiting certain churches and helping. Um, and substitution usually took the form of a money payment, all right? Scholasticism... Um, most of the guys that we're talking about, they agreed and approved of the practice of, of indulgences within reasonable limits. All right, They didn't disagree with them. Aquinas declared it actually impious to say that the church couldn't dispense indulgences. Okay, Just kind of as a recap here. Um, the first known case of indulgences is about 1016. All right, And there's kind of an example uh, of that. So just to kind of conclude here with scholasticism, a um, couple of quick remarks. Uh, one... Again, I think don't don't view these men as deliberate purveyors of false doctrine. I think I think that's to misread the period. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that they were they were men trying to wrestle with the issues of their day, trying to help the churches where they served. And generally speaking, I think the flaw was that they didn't question accepted practices. What they did was they looked for philosophical and theological justifications mm -hmm. for most of the practices. All right, so my, my take on scholasticism is they kind of inverted the process, right? And that theology became the master of the church instead of its servant, mm -hmm. right? That they, that they saw these practices and they worked hard to kind of find scriptures to defend them. They experienced human reason and human fallenness and, and they couldn't justify it and so they leaned on Aristotelian logic and they built scriptures around that. Right? That they couldn't quite understand this whole idea of original sin and what happens to these poor babies and should we baptize them and should we not and, and instead of looking at the sources you know, they created systems to explain things that were hard to understand. And then fourth, uh, fifthly maybe, and lastly, they were in some senses competing with each other in this war of ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's never a great way to do theology. Yeah. Right? It's like, you know, it's, it's like the Calvinists and the Armenians, you know, just firing shots across the bow, you know, um, competing with one another um, is not a great way to do theologies. And I think finally, um, the nascent power and influence of the church overshadowed their lives so much that, that to question the Pope or to challenge the church openly was, was a frightening and nearly impossible task. And so even in cases where they had minor disagreements or personal disagreements, it's rare for one of these scholastics to just kind of jump right out of the box and go after accepted doctrine and practice. That was just very, very unusual. The social, financial, and ecclesiastical pressure 
to not do that was very, very, very great. And so, um, again, I think I would just conclude by saying I think that this was a, a unique period in, in Christian history. A lot of theology, a lot of theology comes out of this period of time. Um, and um, so, some of it quite remarkable. Um, unfortunately, not all of it orthodox. Um, so let's take a break here for a few minutes, and then we're going to uh, jump ahead to sort of the early Reformation, early seeds of the Reformation, the Waldensians, Jan Hus, and other people like that. Come on. Hey, hey Brett. Uh, you got a question from online um, about Anselm. Uh, with regard to Revelation 1 to 18, would Anselm say that Jesus took the keys of death and Hades from Satan as a part of the Hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. Revelation 1.18. Are we live still? You're live, yeah. No, no, I just... Oh, no, you're not. Yeah. He holds in his hands. Yeah, the keys of death in Hades. Would Anselm say that he took those from the devil? I would say no. He yeah. He had them. Yeah, I mean, he, he was given the keys, you know, I think. Um, it says, I hold the keys of death and Hades. It, it's, un, it's unclear that he took them from anyone. I, w- I would say that some in particular would say no. It would only be an early person. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like the devil had sort of, well, yeah. the law was locked up until Christ was put into, uh, I mean, what about that? I mean, I don't I don't know that uh, the law was locked up until faith should be revealed. So that, that's an idea. I'm not sure that, that faith, in a sense, unlocked the full potential of the law. Okay, you're live. Okay. So um, we have a question online. Um, from whom? Uh, from somewhere in Ohio. Shh. Hey guys, I know I know you're taking a break. I'm trying to answer a question here online. So there's a question from Ohio, um, and the question is an interesting one. And the question is this: it, it, You know, would it, it, based on Revelation chapter one, verse 18, where Jesus says, "I am the the living one." I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. And the question was, would St. Anselm say that Jesus took those keys from the hands of the devil? Did I, did I state that correctly? Um, I, I, I'm not sure what Anselm would say. I think he would say no. Um, I'm not sure that... Um, and, 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 I, I, I think probably what he would say was um, that he had been holding those keys. I'm not, I'm not sure that they were in someone else's possession. Um, remember that, that when Jesus died on the cross, um, he, he, he conquered death. Um, and, so, and, and by so doing, I think, you know, when he says he holds the keys of death in Hades, that, that's, that's a metaphor for saying that he's basically vanquished death or unlocked death. Um, the door for anyone that was in death or in Hades. But to say that the devil owned that door, um, I don't think that's actually totally correct. Um, maybe one of the early church fathers would would argue that. The other scripture that may have bearing on this um, is this the idea that Jesus, um, it's in Galatians and it talks about how the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ and that, that the law um, was in a sense that faith was locked up um, you know, until it should be revealed after Christ. And so I think what's probably being suggested here is that Jesus, by his death, unlocked both the fullness of the law, but also the possibility um, that we would win um, over death. So, but in terms of the devil owning life and death, I don't know that anywhere in scripture substantiates um, that idea. I think the devil the devil would say that he, that he makes a claim on our life because of our guilt of sin, because he's the accuser, um, and he is the accuser, um, but he was prosecuted himself, and I think he's the false accuser. So, um, hopefully, that answers your question. There's a lag, so I'm not going to get it. So I'm going to cut this off. Okay. Yeah. Even I was when he asked that question, I was thinking like. Even